And um, I, I'm going to use the word leadership, which I think is completely overused these days. Um, we use that word interchangeably uh, with a lot of different functions. Um, I actually teach a course in that at Rensselaer. Um, and after a lot of Socratic exercises with the students, it really boils down to one attribute. Uh, there's vision and you know all the other things that people talk about. But to define a leader, you have to have followers. It's as simple as that. If nobody's willing to follow you, you may have a high paying job and be able to push people around, but it doesn't mean that you exercise leadership. So what I thought I'd do today um, is talk about using uh, data to drive change. And by that, we mean uh, somebody has to take responsibility. So I'm going to call this a tale of two champions. And I thought perhaps, it, since I think we all like to see the work that's being done, both the technology and the science actually be applied, I thought it'd be interesting to just go through a case study of where uh, I've been fortunate enough to be a part of. Um, and these are recommended standards for the NICU in hospitals. Now this exercise goes back nearly 30 years, um, led by uh, Dr. Robert White. Um, I have to say, um, Bob White's one of my real heroes. He's a very quiet uh, physician uh, in the backwaters of South Bend, Indiana, uh, simply quietly making a huge difference to the neonatal intensive care unit environments, uh, not only in the United States, but I think globally. Now, I said it was a tale of two champions. Uh, Bob actually wears two hats. Um, he's not only uh, well-grounded in the science and the applications of medicine, but he's also the director of the NICU at Memorial Hospital. So he actually is uh, two in one. But what I think is telling, Bob surrounded himself, um, not unlike what some people said here, looking at the kinds of environments that NICUs were uh, for many, many years and seeing how much change had to take place, literally from how you turn on a sink uh, to uh, what uh, should we put carpeting or hard surfaces and floors and so on. And what he did is he managed to gather together uh, people from the United States that were both narrow experts, like myself, in lighting, but he also, if you look at this list, he, feel, he finds people that actually, not unlike himself, can make a change. They can be that champion that actually uh, implements the science and evidence-based design. Uh, one of the people I want to point out is uh, Skip Gregory. Um, he, um, in the top of the second column, he was one of the early champions at uh, the state of Florida uh, in the public health um, organization, I'm not sure the exact title for the state of Florida, but he was one of the first states to adopt uh, the standards. He was an early adopter and now he's serving as a consultant. But you notice there are senior architects uh, uh, on this uh, panel. And really what Bob managed to do was to surround himself with the kind of people that could provide the evidence-based um, information needed to design, but also was clever enough to find people that could actually make a difference, actually implement those ideas. And those two roles are absolutely critical if you really want to make a difference. You can have the technology, you can have the science, but unless someone is going to play one or both roles of champion, you really don't have a lot of chance uh, for success. Now just to show you the topics that are covered in this, this, uh, this, um, uh, this standard, Practically anything you can think of <laughs> that touches a newborn infant has something, this do document has something to say about that. And I think that expansive view, uh, we heard earlier today about how systems interact. It isn't just about lighting. Uh, it isn't just about acoustics. It isn't just about air quality. But someone has to gather this information and think about the interactions and the integration of that information. And uh, Bob is a master at doing that. Now this is literally the way the NICU used to be done. It was uh, kind of an offshoot of, um, of intensive care. Uh, often they would have rooms like this that were kind of set aside and the technology to keep infants alive has progressed considerably in the last 30 years. But this is what Bob's managed to accomplish, not just here, but in 43 of the 50 states in the United States now. Remember 30 years ago there was that. And today, you're seeing a complete transformation of the NICU environment. And there are hospitals literally all over the United States doing major um, renovations, retrofits, expansions uh, to deliver these kinds of things. This is a huge success story, in my opinion. 
And it's literally been an honor to be part of uh, Bob's uh, working group to, to develop those standards. But I think the question before us today, how can you repeat that? Um, I don't think Bob's willing to volunteer uh, to take on the assignment of, for example, uh, offices and so on. And I want to make this point, and I want to stress this point. We've talked about good ideas, good research, and good intentions, and they're not enough. We can sit here and talk to ourselves as long as we like, but if you don't have those two champions, it, it really is not going to go very far. So I would admonish this group that before you begin to think seriously about a transformation at General Service Administration or um, the Army or wherever it happens to be, you can't begin successfully unless you've identified two champions. Now, that is, as I said, that could be one person who plays two roles, but that's, that's somewhat unusual. So you first of all have to identify what I consider to be the intellectual champion. And that person has to be able uh, to make provisions to socialize the science by forming disciples. This person cannot do it himself, otherwise it can border on a crackpot <laughs> uh, enthusiast. You have to be able to surround yourself with the people that have like minds. And then you have to identify an implementation champion. And those people tend to be, I'll just say, more senior, people that have um, been beat up a while trying to make a difference. Uh, so they have to anticipate the barriers before they occur because once a barrier is there, it's very difficult to remove. So you have to uh, anticipate where the, the barriers are going to come from. And then you have to have access to deploy the managers that are actually going to make that happen. Now, I don't know if the hospital environment's unusual. Uh, Bob, I think, is a very sweet guy. But on the other hand, when he wants something, he gets something done. And he delegates to people in the hospital to actually implement that. He's very comfortable at deploying the implementation people. Now, I will say right up front, there is, th this would be sainthood. This is the recipe for intellectual sainthood. Uh, I'm not sure anybody, including Bob, has all of these attributes. But I'd say at the top of the list, you have to be respected in your field. You, you really have to have the stature and respect that everybody is there. Then you have to be comfortable uh, leading teams. Now, he's at Notre Dame, and they're real comfortable with teams, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, you have to be passionate for improvement. You have to be grounded in science, and you have to be persistent. As I tell my students, you will not get a PhD unless you're persistent above all things. You have to be able to have the stick to itness to actually get things done. Socialization of ideas. You have to, of course, have the publications, the talks, the workshops like we're in today. Those are all necessary. Um, but you also have to be comfortable with people that are, uh, let's say, less than attentive to the mission. So you have to be effective in a committee. Uh, Bob, I've seen him use both carrots and sticks in committees. Um, I'm careful to avoid the sticks as much as possible. Um, comfortable with social events. Someone who's not, who's willing to go out and uh, have dinner. Now, Bob always orders steak and Coke. I don't think that's a requirement, but he's at least comfortable out there and everybody knows what he's going to order for dinner. Um, forming disciples. Bob is a born teacher. He spends time on the hospital floor talking to the nurses, sharing his wisdom with that. But he's not, he doesn't boss them around. He simply talks to them about what it is that's important and so on. He's a collaborator and advisor. This is the kind of person that you need that is going to have that intellectual champion that everybody's going to rely on for many of these attributes. Equally important is the implementation champion, a decision maker or at least a person who has influence over power, someone who has the, at least the ear of somebody that's going to be able to make a difference, have to embrace the vision. And by that, I mean they're not doing it necessarily for their own personal gain. Um, they are really bought into the whole idea. And my sense of listening to people today, I think everybody here is bought into the vision that the built environment does make a difference. So I don't think there's any, um, at least within this group, any con convincing that's necessary. But I mentioned before, you have to be able to deploy individuals. This cannot be a load you lift on your own. This is a person who understands management techniques that can actually get things done. The berries of inertia, I'll say architects, project managers, manufacturers, they've always done it this way, and there was no complaint before. What are you talking about? Is the kind of response that they have to anticipate, not wait till you hear it, but able to anticipate. And a lot of the senior leaders that really do make changes have already anticipated those kinds of barriers. Again, carrots and sticks is appropriate. 
Implementation, you need to motivate and inform people on your staff. You've got to be able to talk, <laughs> uh, cajole, whatever it takes to make that happen. You have to cultivate them, the trusted experts, because again, nobody knows everything. So you need a person with wide reach. And then uh, deal with distracting experts, because what happens is you're going to find jealousy, you're going to find competing interests. And I cite this book, which I recommend to everybody, and I, I, I give it to my graduate students, the ones I like anyway. Um, <laughs> By William Beveridge uh, in 1957, uh, it talked about the art of scientific investigation. If you like anything about science, I highly recommend this book. But he brings out a point that I think is important for all of us to remember. That when you have a new idea, you say we're going to make a change in the built environment, the first thing, the first stage that Beveridge says, you're ignored. Nobody will talk to you about it. They go, well, that's all interesting, but so on. So it's dead silence. And then once you get to get traction, then you have the antibodies kick in. Oh, this is a bad idea. It's not practical. This is, you know, you're living a pipe dream. This is a waste of time, waste of government resources and everything. We've got better things to do with that. The third and final stage is, well, that was all obvious. We all knew we need to do that anyway. So you have to live through that frustration, and it takes a personality that is willing to be ignored and still persistent, fight the good fight about what it is that you're trying to accomplish, and then modestly accept, you're right, you were right all along. This is all obvious, and I'm just glad you were part of it. That, my friend, is what it takes to be a good leader. Now, in that context, Bob White, above all else, cautions all of us consistently, beware of imitations. So here's the tummy tub, which is nearly as nice as mommy's tummy. There are going to be people that once you get success, they're going to say, well, mine's just as good as yours. And so if you don't have the grounding of the intellectual champion who understands what is evidence-based design and what is just good intentions, and you don't have that implementation, I suggest all of the good things we've heard today um, are going to be left on the roadside unless we identify champions. I'd like to embarrass, in closing, two people, if I may. Is that okay if I embarrass two people in the room? Well, not me. <laughs> um, I, Mariana spoke earlier about that. I think uh, with regard to the transformation we're trying to make um, in, uh, with GSA, uh, Mariana serves as a remarkable intellectual champion for this whole idea. I, I'm not sure, maybe, I hope you did, fully understand the, the depth and the breadth of what it takes to take the idea, go through the animal studies, it isn't just collecting data, it's interpreting it and then transforming that. That's a, that's a remarkable achievement. Um, the second person I'd like to embarrass is Kevin Kampscher. Um, everybody knows Kevin. Uh, Kevin, uh, I don't have known Kevin long, but Kevin, uh, I've heard him speak privately, and Kevin wants to do the right thing by the, by the people that work in the General Service Administration buildings, and I think that's extremely admirable. I think you also have the reach to make sure that you can deal with William Beveridge's um, admonitions about uh, being ignored, uh, dealing the fight, and then in the end, modestly accepting what was obvious from the very beginning. So I, I, I think we should stand and applaud at least those two people that have been remarkable.